um, uh, Beyond the Scope um, for the talk today. Maybe um, here. Um, he was originally born in Egypt, came to the US, and did his undergraduate work at the University of Minnesota um, and his grad work at the University of Delaware. Um, science his fellow chemist, so we worked together. Science talked about chemistry compared to all the material scientists. But um, so um, with the field, uh, with his PhD, he worked on uh, liquids and ambient pressure XPS. Um, so that kind of brought him back around here, working um, back in uh, CEDEC on um, XPS, where you guys have an ambient pressure XPS. I think you find that a lot of fun, talk about that a little bit. And then also um, the more general uh, capabilities with XPS and uh, I guess a bunch of other stuff there too. Yeah. So we'll uh, be talking about XPS today. So. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's my first time presenting with a stick, so I hope this works out well. Um, my name is Yehia. I respond to different variations of that name. I know that it's weird to say, but it's a yeah, yeah with an H in the middle. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here amongst people who enjoy instrumentation. I see we have a mix here between students and lab managers. So I hope everybody comes out with, uh, today with something. So I was told to talk a little bit about myself. Between my wife and I, we have uh, three cats and a dog that keep the house pretty busy. It's quite nice. Uh, and uh, we do enjoy the outdoors. I have a picture of me here going down a uh, waterfall. I did not enjoy that. I'm putting myself there because I did not have fun. My wife made me do it, but I, it was a good experience. Uh, like uh, Dan mentioned, I did my PhD at the University of Delaware, uh, where I was introduced to ambient pressure XPS. So my career was actually going backwards. So I did ambient pressure XPS, which is the cutting edge of XPS. And then through my job here, I'm, I'm managing a traditional XPS. Um, so today's talk will actually be mostly about the ambient pressure XPS. This is kind of a brief uh, map of what we're gonna talk about today. I'm just gonna make sure that everybody's on the same page of what XPS is and what it does. Um, before I introduce our brand new uh, traditional characterization XPS, the Mixed G2 by Thermal Fisher, I'll talk about something it's a cool feature here that we can use XPS and uh, the microscopy facility here. Then uh, the, the bulk of the talk will be uh, talking about the instrumentation behind your ambient pressure XPS, uh, experimental considerations and setup. And then I have two data sets here that I'll talk about as an example of what XPS and ambient pressure XPS can do. So how many people are familiar with ambient pressure XPS, or sorry, XPS in general? Yeah, we have two, three people, okay. So generally speaking, uh, XPS is based on the photoelectric effect, where what Einstein got his Nobel Prize for, as opposed to the theory of relativity. And this equation um, sort of governs almost all XPS peaks, where dividing energy of an electron is the difference between the photon energy, in our case, the x ray behind these positive holes. So we have a flood gun that essentially, uh, essentially shoots low energy electrons at the surface to neutralize any charge buildup that could happen. So that's how we are able to do insulating samples by shooting these low energy electrons that do not interfere with these faster kinetic energy electrons that are leaving the surface. Yeah. Um, but all these components, along with the sample having a very short mean feed path for these electrons, all of them require uh, at least a high vacuum, a good high vacuum. But traditionally, an XPS system would be sitting under ultra high vacuum conditions. So I have just a simple data set here, nothing too special. This is 60 nanometers of uh, silicon oxide on silicon. This is how XPS spectra or high resolution XPS spectra looks like. We have a silicon 2 P uh, at around 103 EV and oxygen peak for SiO2. We sputter it with some argon uh, and we can get this 60 nanometers down to about 10, five nanometers. And we're able to see both features, both the metallic feature for silicon along with the silicon oxide, okay? Now, if you keep sputtering, you're gonna completely get rid of the oxide or a little bit residuals and you'll be left behind with the silicon 2 p So this is kind of a, a gentle, like a, a death profile, of the, a, a model data set of what you can see in this. List. This insight here is the residual oxygen that is left. Um, one of the things that could happen when you're sputtering is you can introduce knock-in effects. So when you're sputtering really, really hard, some of these oxygens are actually embedded into a deeper layer. So this is another thing to keep in mind. You yeah. run into surface roughness issues, you have to rotate the sample. Or... Yeah, so if you're really, really you're trying to do a good depth profile, you should be rotating the sample. 
and roughness can also introduce charging issues. So sat shadowing effects and stuff. So you try, you want to get your sample to be as flat as possible. So um, we uh, we have a brand new Nexa G2. It is a very uh, user friendly instrument. Uh, we installed this in May. It, it was actually in April. It took two months to get up because we had some problems. Um, but this is a very uh, brand new instrument. It's fully capable. Lakshmi here knows how to use it pretty well. Um, it is equipped with also on top of it, yes, it is equipped with ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy, which is called UPS sometimes. So there's XPS, which is four electron spectroscopy, and UPS, which looks more at valence electrons. Okay, that's very useful for semiconductors and calculating band gaps and such. Uh, it is also equipped with a monatomic argon ion source, so we can shoot individual high energy argon ions, not too different from a FID in some ways. Uh, and we also have a gas cluster ion beam. So it turns out if you put a high pressure of argon through an aperture that's really small, on the other side, it comes up with like supersonic speed and it forms clusters and we're able to accelerate those clusters to surface using gentler energy. So basically you have a very gentle sputtering source. That's the GCIE. And that's made for ultra soft materials and polymers. And it's one of the ways you can avoid some of these knock-in effects and damaging the, your sample and creating artifacts. Um, one of the nice features that made me try to go, go with this instrument is that it has the capability of working with the Aprios microscopes. Um, and the more I look into this, the more uh, me and Dan, are, maybe we can do use other instruments as well. But I have a pretty quick uh, couple of slides about this. So, it's called SIZA. It's brand new. There's not a lot of literature on it. For the life of me, I do not know what that A stands for, uh, but I think it's uh, analysis. Maybe that's it. But essentially, it's a stage that allows you to do XPS and correlate it after you take some fiduciary points to an SEM spot. So this week, actually, uh, with the help of Dan, who really uh, knows how to work with maps, uh, we were able to get this nice little picture here. So it's the second electron picture in the background of a ruthenium copper alloy on top of copper foil. And this big elliptical shape right here, it has it's 200 microns in length on the long side. And that is actually our x-ray spot. So we can overlay where we did our XPS analysis. It can uh, overlay here uh, some XPS uh, spectra. Here we have a survey. The survey, survey spectrum and XPS typically just, you know, you scan the entire range. You want to see what's happening on your surface element. So you can't tell because it's low resolution what those elements are bonded on, uh, to, but you can tell what sort of elements. And so we have the characteristic uh, peaks for ruthenium, copper, and a huge carbon peak right here. So this is a nice little feature that we're still developing, but it's ready for use if anybody has XPS needs and is doing SEM. You might be one of the very first people to publish on this correlative um, uh, feature. So back to this diagram real quick. Um, I talked about why we need ultra high vacuum. Um, high vacuum is also acceptable, negative eights or so, if we're talking about millibars or tours. Um, but analyzing samples under high vacuum is very environmentally irrelevant. A lot of things around us, there's a lot of metals and different salts that have multiple layers of water, quasi-liquid water on top of their surfaces, and we're not aware of that. So when you put them in a vacuum, a lot of that water reserves. So there's not a lot with traditional XPS. It doesn't give you the full picture. So uh, it took some time, but some developments happened in the field where essentially a lot of these things that stopped us from introducing the pressure, we were able to overcome. So the simplest one, and I think this is quite common in environmental SEM, is the introduction of the silicon nitride window that's transparent for x-rays. And so, you know there's a big transmission of the x-rays through that. Um, but the other thing is it turns out that if you introduce one millibar of pressure, so right now we're sitting at one bar, 1,000 millibars, introduce one millibar of pressure, the mean free path of an electron is about one millimeter. So if you bring an aperture really, really close to the sample, sub-millimeter, and uh, have a big pump behind it, so there's a big pump right there, um, it turns out that you can analyze in the presence of pressure these four electrons and get their kinetic energy, and we don't lose a lot of information. Let me correct myself. We do lose a lot of information because the angle of acceptance of these photoelectrons electrons becomes a lot smaller. So it's a very small concept. So you should know this under ambient pressure conditions, you almost always have less signal, a lot less signal than traditional experts. 
But the analyzer that applies a lot of these high voltages still needs to be under at least high vacuum conditions. So by introducing a series of different you know, chambers inside a bunch of these little apertures, uh, we can differentially pump them. Between each stage, the pressure drops by a couple of orders of magnitude at the very least. So one millibar here, over here, we get negative twos, negative threes, negative fours, negative fives, and so on until we reach the detector, which is in the negative sevens, depending on what the primary pressure in the stage is. Um, all these series of apertures would obviously be cutting off more and more signals. So we just introduce a series of electrostatic lenses to refocus these electrons down to the ends. So this is a picture of what the sample looks like. Uh, this is just a, a sample that you know lights up when we hit it with x-rays to find our x-ray spot. And here's the aperture. Our aperture is about 300 microns in diameter. And so you end up with something that looks like this. It's quite massive. Uh, we have seven turbos on our system. Um, we have a high pressure zone here. This is where the sample sits, and this is where we put our few millibars of pressure that we're interested in. And through these differentially pumping chambers, uh, the analyzer is sitting in the negative sevens and eights without a problem. Um, so there's been a rise on these uh, of these instruments. That's why I was hired here at Ohio State. Uh, the first one was at Uppsala University, 1970, uh, by Kai Sigmund, who got the Nobel Prize for sort of instrumentalizing the photoelectric effect and making sure that making you know surface science on a long scale as possible. Um, and as you can see here, as years went by, there's an explosion here, you know, early 2000s when it comes to these instruments getting installed. Uh, and we're right here. So I arrived here at Ohio State in 2019, uh, sorry, 2018. I started in December and the instrument arrived in January following year. So I had a few weeks to figure out how to order everything that's needed for the installation. That was a fun couple of weeks. But right after us, Lehigh got one. Uh, Notre Dame has had one for quite some time. But they're popping up now more and more often. The areas of uh, study that, that utilize um, and the pressure XPS are there's a big chunk of it that's just the calcis. You can see why. I tell people as an example of what I do who have nothing to do with science. You know, I study stuff that goes into a catalytic converter. This is what it is heterogeneous catalysis. We have gas phase flowing and the solids, and they transform this gas phase into the but there's a bunch of different things. Electrocatalysis is a huge area that's uh, increasing in. Uh, methods and instrumentation on its own is pretty cool. A lot of people are doing, some people in Switzerland are doing liquid jets and ambient pressure XPS, so they're actually shooting uh, droplets across a vacuum and doing XPS on the surface of these droplets. You have to average a lot of droplets, so yeah. This is a picture of our system that I thought is a little clear. I have a, 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 the actual system in the next slide. Um, but if you just look at this frame right here, here's your hemisphere analyzer. If you look at this frame right here and just cut that off, so everything behind it, you're just looking at this section right there. That is the traditional XPS. That, there's nothing going on there. It's just ultra high vacuum, all that good stuff. This back region here is the Debbie Sent from Steps, which is a company you're doing. So this, is, uh, this whole cell is on a motor. And we have a giant gate valve. This is a gigantic gate valve um, that opens, and we can bring switch into the system, and it locks into the front end of the analyzer. And so on the inside, we have uh, an ambient cell. On the outside of that, we have ultra high vacuum, and then at the outside of that, I'm standing on top. Okay. Um, so we can do zero to twenty millibars. Zero to twenty millibars doesn't seem like a lot. Right? It's, we're sitting at 1,000 millibars right now. But when you take into consideration that the partial pressures of gases that are reactive in the air, they're very small. So water, for example, at the point at which water will form liquid droplets, we're talking about a pressure of 20 to 23 millibars. Okay? So if we're doing an analysis at three to five millibars, that is actually reasonably close to what actual environmental conditions. Uh, we have a aluminum K alpha source, Butter and flash capabilities for single crystals. And these are some of the gases that we readily have available. Um, this is a picture of the system. Um, it, it's kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, this room should not have two XPSs on it, but space is always uh, an issue. In the back here, you see our old Prayas system that was installed in 2002. Uh, I like to say I was 12 years old. I was, like, I was 12 years old when they were rolling the system 
uh, into uh, at Ohio State. So that was pretty cool. So we retired the system, and this is where the Nexa G2 sits right now. Yeah. And here I have a video of how the cell docks. So like I said, it's on a motor that goes forward at the gate valve. And these pins right here go through these holes to guide the cell and make sure it's well centered. And between these, this part, this part, there's an O ring that seals the cell against the back. So that's how that is. Um, this locking mechanism right here ensures that there's a good amount of pressure being applied to people because the cell kind of moves. It's a pretty impressive job. And this is where the sample goes. So you see two screws right here. Uh, screw beams three, three turns at a time and then push at the bottom where they're on hinges, door flops open, you put in a sample and lock it and make sure that it's uh, leak top. You can imagine the amount of leaks that could happen when you have an ambient pressure zone outside of that ultra high vacuum. So sometimes I like to call myself a uh, space plumber because I've gotten pretty good at finding all these different leaks. Oops. All right, so before we jump into uh, uh, data, I just want to mention some experimental considerations. If you want to impress someone that you know something about ambient pressure XPS, ask them about the distance from the aperture, okay? So this uh, diagram simply describes what, how the pressure varies based on how far you are uh, from the aperture. Because you have a huge turbo pulling on this gas on the first differential pumping zone, uh, if you are about here, for example, and you're trying to reach P naught, whatever P naught is, let's call it one millibar, your sample surface is actually experiencing only 0.8 millibars, okay? So that's something that some people won't pay attention to. They'll just optimize their sample and not take into consideration if they're far enough away from the aperture to make sure that they're actually experiencing that gas. Um, the rule of thumb in the community is so long as you're one aperture distance away, that's at least 95% of your city, right? Or sorry, the pressure. So if we're, we're, if we're at one millibar and we're exactly one aperture distance away, we're really at 0.95 millimeters. And you can imagine how this can introduce uh, problems when we start varying the temperature because you have, you know, things expand and contract. And if you're not paying attention, you're doing a hot experiment, your sample will actually crash into the aperture. And that's something to try to avoid at all costs. Some additional experimental considerations. Uh, we put in the gases using mass flow controllers, nothing too fancy, but how do you introduce liquids, right? So we have these blasted cobar connections with liquid bulbs that we fill with whatever liquid we're interested in, and we pull off of the vapor of that. Not too different from an environmental acid. But one thing that we do do, because we're very surface sensitive, is we always freeze pump thaw our liquids. So water is a very easy one to understand. A lot of there's a decent amount of carbon dioxide that gets dissolved in water to form carbonic acid. And when you pull vacuum on water, a lot of that CO carbonic acid gets transformed back into CO2. To try to do XPS uh, and try to introduce water without freeze pumping it, you're going to introduce a lot of carbon into the chamber without freeze pumping. Well, you realize it because you want your stuff will be covered in carbon. So, the first set here that I have for you, um, I have two studies is looking at methanol on polycrystal platinum toy. Okay. So uh, it is widely known that at room temperature, methanol will immediately catalyze to carbon monoxide and water on the platinum surface. And that's just well known. And uh, platinum is obviously a very precious material. It's very catalytically active. So people are really trying to understand platinum and how it interacts with CO because they're trying to replicate the chemistry of platinum using cheaper materials such as copper or what have you. Uh, Dr. Anko in the chemistry department uh, was interested to see if there was what is called a methoxy species. So it'll be a platinum, O, and then a uh, methyl group. Um, the literature said that there is no methoxy existed. And we were wondering if we can just lower the temperature to capture methoxy in spectroscopy. News, a news flash we did not find. So, you know, that was, it was just didn't exist. But what we ended up doing was something accidental, but it was pretty cool. So uh, this next set is the first set of real XPS data from an ambient pressure XPS. Uh, and we we're gonna start from the bottom. So we have platinum 4F, oxygen 1S, carbon 1S. We're looking at anything from the P, D, and F orbitals. It has this natural JJ coupling, and so we see split. So if you're looking at any orbital that is beyond S, 
you'll always have two peaks. So these are two, not two different planning features. This is one planning feature. Yeah? So when we're starting at the bottom here, we cleaned our platinum by sputtering it. We have no oxygen. It's it, the uh, background here is bending because there's a massive peak for platinum at uh, I think it's like 80D. Uh, so it changes the background of where the oxygen is. Um, with carbon, because we cleaned it, no carbon. So no carbon, no oxygen, plenty of uh, planets. Just moving it from where we sputter into the nap cell. So this is the nap cell. Unfortunately, it picks up contamination. That's how sensitive we are uh, to contamination. In the course of 15 minutes, we start to see the buildup of signal here. Um, and platinum happens to be one of the spongiest materials for carbon. Um, we started flowing methanol at 165 Kelvin. We did that via liquid nitrogen cooling. And we saw some rise in oxygen. And we started to see these two features right here that are indicative of CO top and CO bridge. And if you're anybody who's closely related to data science, the signal to noise is just almost a fact, right? This is, but this is what we're working with, with a uh, lab-based X-ray source. At a synchrotron, the signal would be a lot higher. Uh, but it's not a bad starting point, and we're cautious with what we're saying with this. But we have these two peaks that agree with the literature of how CO top and bridge sits on planet. What we didn't expect is when we lowered the temperature a little bit, because we, we wanted to see another feature here or something that indicates this methoxy. At 160 Kelvin, so just a five Kelvin difference, it was crazy. So this is the background. It looks a little, you know, hazy because it's noise, but that's how much signal to noise we gained. So carbon and oxygen just shot up and platinum disappeared. And what that meant was that we formed layers and layers and layers of frozen methanol on top of our planet. And so I just want you guys to understand our surface here. We have the surface terminates where platinum ends, and then we have a sub monolayer of carbon monoxide. And then on top of that is a lot of frozen methanol. And then we stopped leaking in methanol and we took a lot of spectra as we are raising the temperature. And what we saw at 160 and 165 is still a trace amount of uh, frozen methanol that was still uh, getting catalyzed and at the same time subliming off of the platinum surface. And we saw these two feature features that belong to CO top and CO bridge rise. Obviously, the signal to noise is improving. And uh, we went all the way up to 195. Uh, from the oxygen spectra, it follows the same trend, except that we have an additional peak right here, which is molecularly absorbed water. Obviously, that will show up in the oxygen spectra, but not the carbon spectra. So this is kind of an example of showing how, uh, you know, the takeaway from this is even at 165 and 160 Kelvin, when we take a lot of that thermally accessible energy, methanol will just decompose naturally, even at freezing temperatures, well below the freezing point of water. So we're going to shift gears to a different project uh, where ambient pressure XPS contributed to solar cells. So uh, perovskites are materials that are geologically very uh, prevalent, uh, and they happen to have a good band gap that follows the sun's uh, spectrum. And so they're good candidates, except that um, this MAP feature, so this is a methylamine, these are the methylamine ions here, lead iodide, lead is inside of these crystals, and the iodide surrounds it, obviously. Um, they're not stable at 85 degrees Celsius, and that, temp that number is a magic number. That's the industry standard for a lot of uh, photovoltaic materials to be seriously considered in industrial applications. Uh, and multiple studies have shown that if you add these simple organic molecules, in this case, DDTPA, it's a dibromo triphenylamine, uh, we have a nitrogen molecule in the middle here, or sorry, atom in the middle here, uh, it turns out that it coordinates nicely to this perovskite. Um, in this feature here, based on some DFT studies, and it changes things quite dramatic. So what I have next is a series of experiments. They're isotherms. So we kept the temperature at room temperature, and we varied the pressure. And so we have the lead 4F, and this is set up a little differently, where the 4 is here. We raise the pressure, and post, after we evacuate the water, we have the lead doublet that's expected from a, a lead 4F feature. Uh, nitrogen uh, is also uh, obvious, iodine, nothing too different. Nothing is shifting left or right, nothing is appearing, no shoulder is growing, nothing is going on, so pretty boring. 
The only thing that's happening is the signal is really dropping, and that's that should be expected, right? We're increasing the pressure, more scattering, loss of signal. Nothing too crazy. Same thing with the uh, mapping DPTPA. DPTPA, uh, where the uh, the only difference between this is the nitrogen spectrum. Because the organic molecule has a nitrogen feature that has a different chemical environment, we're able to see that feature nicely. Okay. So the takeaway from the slide is these perovskites are very stable in the presence of humidity at room temperature. Shouldn't be surprising considering that they are they exist in a lot of areas on the planet. Um, but then we start varying the temperature, and this is where things got interesting. So uh, what we have here is just the perovskite without this organic. Uh, thin film, and before is same features like before, but at 100 degrees Celsius under the same pressure, so these are iso bars, we start to see this emergence of this new feature, and this is where I get really excited whenever I see a new peak appear. That's actual chemistry. And so as we raise the temperature, this feature continues to grow, and that's associated with lead zero. When we're looking at nitrogen, um, same thing, except that the nitrogen completely disappears at 150 and 200 degrees, iodine, nothing happens. So takeaway from the slide is new peaks on the lead, nitrogen disappears, iodine stays the same. So we have lead two plus and iodine. Uh, when we add the film, it's quite nice to see how much it stabilizes the perovskite. So under the same temperatures, we see no features, no breakdown of that perovskite until 200 degrees Celsius is where we start to see the emergence of lead zero, so for that degradation. And that can be simply attributed to the fact that this molecule sort of protects the active sites where water under in the presence of heat would attack the perovskite and initiate that degradation. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, look at the mechanism real quick to see what's going on. So this is the perovskite. In the presence of heat and water, it breaks down to methylene gas, hydrogen iodide, and lead Diiodide. So we should understand now, because the methylamine completely evaporates the crystal structure, why the nitrogen signal completely disappeared at 150 degrees. Um, there, we still have lead 2 plus because in this first step of the degradation, lead iodide, if you remember your basic organic chemistry or chemistry, this is in the 2 plus state, right? Now, in the presence of more heat, this compound breaks down to metallic lead. That's where our zero plus feature rises, and iodine gas. And uh, that is a very simple example of, I mean, this is the best case scenario. Something follows the mechanism, the peaks explain themselves, and uh, it was a really nice project. A not so nice thing was under vacuum, that lead evaporates and coated my aperture, and uh, it took me a few weeks to understand what's happening. I had to pop up the cell, and I saw this, and this forever stays. It's not going away here. So, yeah, I hope I didn't rush through this. I know we had some technical issues in the middle. Um, but in conclusion, I gave you guys a little understanding of what XPS does, the evolution of MAP XPS, and the instrumentation that was required to enable MAP XPS. And uh, I highlighted this new feature that I really do hope gets utilized. It was $9,000 for, uh, for the stage, and I don't think we even need it. So that's what's funny. I think we paid nine thousand dollars for the license again. So that's what it is. Um, and I hope I give you an example. So this is map XPS. The nice thing about all the data that I show you is traditionally people would do stuff to their sample, then take it to the XPS, then take it out, and then do other stuff and put it in. Everything that I've showed you today is in situ. It's happening as we're uh, doing the experiment. In terms of future work, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the area of photo uh, photolysis, uh, photo excitation, but especially in situ electrochemistry. Uh, so people are designing liquid cells that goes inside of the vacuum and to do in situ electrophotolysis and observe these features uh, via XPS. But honestly, the ideas are endless. There's a lot of things that we can do. As you saw, our system is very exposed. It's all metal. This is you know, a real old school surface science instrument. It's highly modifiable. And so there, you know, there's a lot of room for things to do in the future. Last is I uh, wanted to just highlight other two other instruments that I'm in charge of. So I talked about the XPS and the MAP XPS. We also have an AFM that's quite underutilized. Uh, this is a graphene sheet right here. It's just showing you the simple capabilities of it. 
Uh, and we also have an X-ray absor absorption fine structure instrument that's arriving in the next few months. Uh, to be honest, I'm excited for that because I don't know much about XOPS, so this will be a new technique. And we're located right next to the physics building um, on in the basement of Seabed. I'm happy. Here's my email. If you guys have any follow-up questions or ideas for projects, I'm, I'm I'm pretty happy to work with. I do want to warn you though, as a lot of lab managers are aware, there's always something not working at all times. Right? So it's always a shifting game of what's happening. Um, I think that's it. Um, if I just have 30 more seconds, I just want to mention XPS has really grown in Lakshmi. I talk to Lakshmi all the time about this. Uh, it's really grown in popularity, but there's a problem because a lot of people who are not trained as circuit scientists make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and so this is a paper from 2020 that looked at 409 papers across three different journals, and they sort of, they're pretty harsh critics, I have to say, like, um, that the average of the whole field, more than 30% are flat out so concerning that they'd be like, that's a red, right? Orange is not fatal, but problematic. And obviously green is good. And so I do want to highlight this. This is broken down by fitted and unfitted, sorry, fitted and unfitted data. You can see here, the less you say, the less mistakes that you can make. So you should say things that you're absolutely sure about, okay? Uh, and so I just figured to put this on here. This is from 2020, but there's, it's continuously happening. Uh, and I just want to highlight, not to sound cheesy, but we all have a responsibility here to catch each other and just try to recommend, especially if we're experts on our own. Sounds good? All right, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, we have time for questions. If you have questions uh, for um and I'll see if we can come back. Yeah. What was the time scale for like measuring when you're like looking at those surface level interactions? Like how long are you collecting those measurements? That's a very good uh, that's a very good question. So if you're doing traditional XPS like characterization, it's about 20 minutes, half an hour. It also depends on how much concentration of the material, how many elements you're scanning. But the rule of thumb is an hour per sample. Ambient pressure XPS is a lot longer because we have to collect the longer, you know, we have to scan more and such. So some of my experiments in grad school were 18 hours. And so we'd actually use shifts, you know, 12 hour and eight hour shifts. Um, at a synchrotron, it's the same thing. You're collecting throughout the night and such. So yeah, it depends on what you're doing. If you're just doing a quick analysis, it'll let it be less than an hour. If you're trying to do a real ambient pressure experiment, easily eight hours. More questions? Yeah. It's like the sample preparation. Sample preparation, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, depends on what kind of sample, right? Uh, I see a lot of powders in my uh, facility. And so in terms of sample preparation, it's trying to make sure that powder is as flat as possible. Because a lot of these particles can create shadowing effects like that, with the x-ray shooting at one side and not the other. Let's say you do Steel, and not much to do besides sputtering it and getting it. I saw one question online. You opened yourself up on this last slide. So okay, about. cool. Dave was asking, um, what's the energy resolution of the XF system? Um, sample requirements, all that kind of stuff. Trans transmission. For the XFs? Yeah. Is that some Okay. What details um, you know about that? Please yeah. make sure that he has my information because I'll be completely honest. I have no idea. I have very little idea about this instrument. I'm waiting for it to arrive and get trained on it. Essentially. All I do know is that it's not a surface sensitive technique. It's a bullet technique. Is it transmission? Um, I think so, but it's also can be modified to do Zane's X ray absorption near edge spectroscopy. So I know it's also highly modified. Yeah. When's it getting here? Uh, so we had issues with releasing state funds and such. Um, yeah. um, so we missed our manufacturing slot. I think in the next two or three months, it should be here. But please let him know. You can feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to keep him updated. Yeah, that's it. He's great. Cool. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Comparing it to excellence. Excellent. Ener electron energy loss. Oh, yeah. Energy structure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, 
I appreciate you guys joining me on this great Friday. Aside from the little hiccup here. But, all right. Thank you guys.